Hello there, once again, Digital World. Welcome back to another episode of Spliced in Ladder. It's movie review time here once again. A couple of little disclaimers before we get into it. The first one being, uh, if you caught my Wonka review, I did mention that I was unwell. Uh, that is still the case now. Um, I unfortunately have some horrible cough thing which just will not go away. Uh, so if I sound out of breath or if I splutter or if there are some some odd cuts, <laughs> nearly coughed there, uh, during the episode, I do apologize. Unfortunately, there is just nothing I can do um, except cry, I guess. Um, and the other thing is, I, I think I have to apologize a little bit for my Wonka review. I'm not sure because I it was the 250th episode, which I didn't even mention when I did it. So yeah, not much of a celebration on that one. But I made like a little combination picture, which had all my logos from the past 250 of episodes, 50, and I put them up there. All seemed well, but then when I was uploading it onto YouTube, the format was completely different. I guess because the picture was more of a box shape than a than a portrait landscape one or whatever, uh, which completely threw everything off, especially when you try to watch it on your phone. I think it's okay in the long run. If you watch it on your TV or, or anything like that, it's not as noticeable, but... Um, I really don't like it. It's my OCD is completely unhappy with it. Um, unfortunately, it takes a long time to upload this stuff, so I didn't replace it so much as it's just. It definitely stands out as the 250th episode, just because it just looks fucked. Uh, going forward, I think we'll just throw that aside and just keep the regular music, keep the regular logo that I've been using. Because you know, who cares? You don't need to change things up every 50 episodes, and really, not a lot of people are listening to you, and that's totally fine on that ground. Uh, so, but yeah, if you were going like, hmm, that's a bit odd, that's a bit strange, I apologize. I don't think many people do. If you're listening to my episodes, you know that the video quality is non-existence. Um, it is a podcast. It is me talking mostly. Originally, this was up on Spotify before it became unfeasible to keep doing that per se. Uh, YouTube's a good enough home for it. However, the accompanying visuals are normally just my logo and the poster for whatever movie I'm talking about. Sometimes some posters from some other movies, if I'm doing top tens or talking about older movies uh, in sequence as well or something like that. But for the most part, it is a listening show, not a watching show. So I don't think the format is a huge thing, but um, for my OCD, uh, I apologize. It won't happen again because I can't hit, I can't take it. Anyway, let's get right into it. For our most likely second last review of the year, we are doing Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget, a movie that has just released on Netflix as of last Friday, the 15th of December. It is a sequel to the 2000 movie Chicken Run from Ardman Entertainment, the creators of Wallace and Gromit, with the use of stop-motion plasticine animation for their storytelling. Now, as you know, 2000 was 23 years ago. This is a sequel 23 years in the making, apparently, Picking up with our old friends, the chickens, Ginger and Rocky, Babs, Bunty, Fowler, all of them, and seeing what adventures they're up to now that they have escaped from Mrs. Tweedy's chicken farm um, and what what befalls them in their current oasis of haven at the moment. I love the original Chicken Run. The original Chicken Run is without a doubt one of my all-time favorite movies, by far. There's no competition. I remember watching it in the theaters, which is huge, 23 years ago. I actually remember I was overseas on holidays when it came out. I was in England, so I may have seen it before anyone else because, you know, England, it's an English film, so they would have got it first. Um, but because I was a big Wallace and Gromit man as well, I liked that Ardman animation style and also its humor. So I remember, also a bit of fun information for you as well, it was also like a a life raft to go see this film because also at the same time was a movie called Thomas and the Magic Railroad. My brother loved Thomas the Tank Engine. I think we had seen the movie five or six times and he really wanted to see it again. And there was a desperate, please, can we see anything else? Hey, what's this? Chicken Run. That seems all right. We'll go see that instead. One day I'll do a whole episode on Chicken Run, but it suffice it to say it's just fantastic. It is a very funny movie, a very well-made movie, 2000, to do a stop-motion plasticine feature film. It was probably their first feature film, I think. They'd been doing their Wallace and Gromit movies, which were short, 42-minute things. They weren't feature-length, and they hadn't got around to the Wallace and Gromit feature film until 2005. So this was probably their first one. 
unless there's another one I am forgetting at this point in time. I remember being so impressed by it, like laughing a lot at it, being so invested in this plight of these chickens in this Great Escape homage who are locked up in this this Gestapo nightmare chicken farm run by the Tweedies, with Mr. Tweedy being the face of the farm, but Mrs. Tweedy being the nightmare psychopath behind it all. And in a very Great Escape montage, Ginger, the leader of the chickens, tries to get them out to escape, to get over the wire and off to freedom uh, before they either end up dead or murdered, well, dead and dead, really. And through the unexpected arrival of a surprising flying rooster called Rocky, they begin to come up with an idea where the chickens will fly away. Chickens don't normally fly, but these chickens are going to learn to fly so they can escape Tweety's farm. Very funny, very silly, lots of silly British humour that I think uh, is, is, is a gem in and of its own right. And then also surprisingly dark in a lot of places, quite violent, quite upsetting. If you're a young kid, you might have been traumatized watching this. I know there's one particular scene which I'm going to mention coming up later in a comparison to this new one. But I remember that when it happened in the theater, my parents beside me like tensed up because they were worried how I would react. And I remember genuinely feeling upset and horrified by what I was seeing, but in essence of pulling me further into the story and getting me fully invested in the plight of these chickens. It is a fantastic film. I'll do a whole episode on it another time. If you haven't seen it, I implore you to see it. It's one of my highest things I can recommend. Chicken Run, great time. There have been talks for years since then, because Chicken Run was released to critical acclaim and a box office success, that there would be another. It's like, if this is good, this is, I mean, this is the Hollywood IP at the moment, right? If a movie's good, you immediately put a sequel into production and in fees, pre, release something of inferior quality just to capitalize on that thing. There was some horror movie that came out this year, I believe it was called like Talk To Me, which was a surprising hit, didn't cost a lot of money to make. So within seconds of that movie coming out, Talk To Me 2 was announced and pushed into production. Um, I don't know why. I believe there's a lot of reasons why there was not a sequel for a long time. Something to do with not knowing what to do with the story. As great as the characters and the stories are, I think the idea is fully based around chickens escaping a farm. What do you do with the chickens once they're free? How do you continue their story? Is there a story worth telling? Sure, they could be fun to check in and have a fun time with them, but a lot of what made that first movie good was the threat of the Tweety farm. If it's gone, can you still deliver with these characters? And then I think there were some hardships for Ardman as well. They put all their effort into the Wallace and Gromit feature film, The Curse of the Were-Rabbit, which was great. And then not long after that, I believe there was like a horrible fire that just decimated their workshop, destroyed all their plastering figures, Wallace and Gromit, Chicken Run, uh, Flushed Away, I think was another movie that got affected at that time too. Um, Flushed Away was also a huge disappointment at the box office. There was a sense that maybe Ardman, this style has hit its peak already. And there's, there's not much point to go on to that, especially when another one, I think Early Man, which was plasticine, but completely CGI, so not as much effort in the practical side went into it. Also, I think just came and went without people even knowing it came out. So a lot of stuff there, which is probably why when they finally went to it, it's coming out on Netflix rather than trusting it with a theatrical release. I think, as I said, Chicken Run is something they probably went into a box and were like, we need something to make that has an IP brand that people will recognize. And we just have to hope to hope against hope. They'll go, I know that thing. I'll watch it, regardless of whether it'll be good or not. It's from a thing that I know, rather than a brand new idea. I honestly don't think it's taken them 23 years to come up with this story. Uh, not a chance. I believe this is probably something that was only really put into production over the last couple of years, and here we have. Now, leading up to this, I was very excited for it. This movie and another movie, which hasn't come out yet, that we're both heading to, Disney, um, to Netflix, Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget, and Beverly Hills Cop, Axel F, which very recently dropped its teaser trailer for that movie. It hasn't come out yet. That trailer looks so dope. I cannot wait for this movie. Hopefully. Might have learned some lessons after watching this particular film. Uh, but they're legacy sequels to things that I really loved from my youth. I loved Chicken Run. I loved Beverly Hills Cop. I, of course, pay for Netflix. I own Netflix. So as soon as it's available, I can watch it. It's something that validates me having a Netflix subscription because there's a lot of reasons at the moment why I should just 
cancel it. And I'm one step closer, I think. But annoyingly with Netflix movies, they announce the movies are coming. They show you the trailers, but they don't give you a release date. So you just sort of wait in the void until eventually they're like, oh yeah, it's this date. And you go, okay, cool. It's like, actually, no, it's actually four weeks earlier. No, now it's two weeks back. Uh, So it's a little bit of a mess trying to look forward to a film. You just have to hope one day it's just going to be out and you're free at the time that it's out to watch it. Um, But the trailers looked all right for it. The premise seemed interesting. Um, I had a Christmas party that was on at the same time that this movie was on. Uh, Having not felt well, I didn't really stay that long at the Christmas party. But also, kind of, I wanted to get home and watch Chicken Run, Dawn of the Nugget. Um, As we're 11 minutes into this movie and I haven't told you, into this review, and I haven't told you how I felt about it, I'll say right now, I didn't like it. I'm very sad to say that. The disclaimer of all that before, though, is just to let you know that take my review with a grain of salt because I love Chicken Run so much. It is very possible that I've built that original movie and its legacy up to such a high standard that anything that a sequel would have done afterwards wouldn't have lived up to the hype. It's very, very likely. But thinking honestly, I I think I'm being fair where I say that this movie isn't bad. It just exists. I hate those type of movies. Those movies where there's nothing incredible about them. There's nothing awful about them. They just fine. They just exist. And you can tell that it's just something that really is made to capitalize on something that came before without any real sort of heart or love put into it. Comparing this to a Johnny English movie, the gaps between the three Johnny English movies range anywhere from five years to nine years. Every time a new Johnny English movie is announced it's coming, I'm like, are you serious? We're still doing Johnny English movies? But when I watch those movies, yes, the sequels are probably of lesser quality to that original. Let's not be, let's be fair though, the original Johnny English isn't incredible. It's awesome, but it's not Citizen Kane. But I feel when I watch those movies that it took that long for those stories to be hammered out because you have to come up with what reasons are needed to bring Johnny English back and where he is as a character eight or nine years between movies. Whereas with this one, it does feel like people just locked themselves in a room for a weekend and went, all right, what could we do with these chickens? That doesn't rely too much on elaborating on their characters or building them up or anything, but just gives them an adventure. Oh, they broke out of a chicken farm last time. This time they break into one. The basic plot of Dawn of the Nugget is the chickens, Ginger and Co, are all living in this little chicken oasis that they found. It's an island. They've been living there since they escaped the Tweedy farm. uh, And they live there blissfully. They do not leave that island. Ginger, their leader, who was originally all about escaping and going to freedom, is now like, now we stay here and we do not leave because if we leave, we die. Especially now that me and Rocky have had an egg and given birth to our own daughter, Molly. However, Molly is just like her mum of the past. She wants to leave the island. She wants to see the world out there. She feels like she's imprisoned on this island because of that attitude. So being a rebellious teenager that she is, she sneaks across the river. She goes out into the real world. She runs into another chicken who tells her that she's following this truck, which has a picture of a chicken on the side sitting in a bucket with two thumbs up. They think it looks like some sort of paradise. Tailing this truck, they get scooped up and get thrown into like a what originally seems to be a chicken paradise where they get to run around and eat tons of feed and there's fake flowers in the sky and all seems well but really what's happening is they've walked into a chicken nugget manufacturing plant run by this scientist dr fry who straps these necklaces on the chickens which like brainwashes them and makes them docile because he is of the belief that's if a chicken is aware it's about to die it makes the chicken tender and gross uh, where if they're blissfully happy as they fall into the meat grinder the chicken tastes delicious and lo and behold his partner in this is mrs tweedy she's back she's divorced mr tweedy she's the mastermind behind the whole thing again Uh, she's the one who's come up with the idea of making mrs tweedy's chicken nuggets they're exclusively making chicken nuggets because they want to sell them to a vendor Uh, So Eats A Lot, which is kind of like the old happy chef of the British world where there's restaurants on every five minutes along the M4, M5 highways or whatever. Once Ginger and co. realize Molly has been captured, they launch a rescue mission, mainly Ginger, Rocky, uh, Babs the idiot, Bunty the muscle, 
Mac, the brains, Fowler, the old rooster, and Nick and Fetcher, the grifting rats, they're all back together to go and rescue Molly from this farm and also face off with Mrs. Tweedy once again because boy oh boy does Mrs. Tweedy have a particular vendetta against Ginger when she realizes she's here in the chicken farm. Um, that's all it is. The, the entire movie is just breaking into this chicken factory thing to rescue Molly. There's not a lot more going on after that. To talk about the positives, um, it is funny. It's not as funny as the original. It's not, nothing is as good as the original chicken run, but it has that Ardman humor, which made me laugh at stupid things on more than one occasion. There's a moment where this guy, the doctor is talking about his farm and he's showing off a remote with a special button that does a thing but he's holding three remotes while he says it and someone says why are you holding three remotes and this really long awkward pause before he just says nobody knows <laughs> it's so stupid but that's the type of stuff i live for from ardman humor it's very ab ab abstract silly dumb humor that works in ardman productions because of the plasticine nature of it all it gives everything a little sense of uh abstractness because of the plasticine stuff. I also really enjoy seeing these characters again, uh, mainly for the nostalgia. I do see Bunty threaten to punch someone out, and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember when you were doing that 23 years ago. Uh, and I especially like having Mrs. Tweedy back. Mrs. Tweedy doesn't show up into the film about until about probably like halfway, uh, but once she is, the movie's completely elevated Miranda Richardson's back to voice Mrs. Tweedy and just the sinister nature that she has about her just this this ghoulish way she wants to just kill chickens and make food out of them for revenge the most petty revenge possible is truly delightful and she's terrifying she's one of the most terrifying villains in cinema history I think mainly because of the plasticine look but because she's swinging meat cleavers she's trying to dump chickens into into nugget processing machines. Uh, she may or may not have killed Mr. Tweedy. We don't really know. He's just nowhere to be found. So she's great in it. So it's great to see everybody again. I liked the humor, the style and all of it. Um, and I can say uh, the behind the scenes stuff confirms it, but you can tell watching it as well that this is the original Ardman style of production. It's the painstaking process of making plasticine figurines putting them in front of a camera and then taking a frame, a single frame, then going in, moving the chicken ever so slightly, taking another frame and doing that 600 times until you've done a scene where Ginger walks from one side of the, the chicken oasis to the other. That's insane. I don't understand how people have the patience for that, but kudos to them. The fact that they went to the effort of doing that instead of doing the early man thing where it's like, it's the plasticine look but we're just generating on a computer kind of contradicts me when I'm like, was there any love put into this on a practical sense on that love of creating a story like this with your bare hands. It's there and I give them credit for it. But at the end of the day, the movie just didn't do anything for me. I was, the movie's only 96 minutes and I felt every single second of it. It started off all right, where it's like sort of going, here we are, we're ready to go, it's chicken run time. But very early on, you know exactly what's gonna happen. You know what points need to happen to get to a certain point. And then that sinking point when you realize, oh, the entire movie is just this escapade into the chicken factory and back, when the chicken factory itself is only whittled down to about three or four set pieces. Maybe that's because it's <laughs> making everything by hand, I suppose. Uh, you realize, oh, okay, this is really going to be it. And I wouldn't mind so much if the characters went on some sort of emotional grope for journey watching it. If it's a single set piece. I just watched an uh, episode of Babylon 5 recently, which was just one set piece where the main character and a guy are talking to each other back and forth for 40 minutes. That's kind of like this, a singular setting, but the way the characters change from that first moment when they walk into the room and meet each other to at the end where they have their final breakdown and confrontation with each other. Those characters evolve before our eyes over 40 minutes and it's incredible. In this, not only do the characters not really evolve or have nothing to do, the one character that does, Ginger, 
only evolves to be what she was when the last chicken run ended. She's this heroic, I love her in the first movie, she's this heroic chicken leader who never says die and is the, the glue that holds all those chickens together to make sure they don't go insane uh, and escape that chicken farm. So when this movie starts, suddenly she's regressed. She's fearful of the world. She doesn't want to leave the chicken oasis. She's scared for her daughter. When she hears that chickens nearby are being taken to some mysterious place to die, she says, well, we will hide and we will not draw attention to ourselves. It's disappointing because then not only do you realize that this isn't the ginger you were rooting for before, but then the rest of the movie is just letting her realize that part of herself again, which is fine. But if the movie didn't exist, I never would have assumed she had regressed. So by the time she gets to the end, she's like, all right, now we're going to liberate chickens all over the world. I'm like, cool. Okay. I thought you were doing that before. I guess not. So if you're having a character go through a, a character development to make them the character you already knew they were, I think you lose something in that. And alongside that, unfortunately, everybody else doesn't have anything to do. Rocky is funny in certain bits, but he's nowhere near as memorable as his first appearance and insignificant to the plot. Babs, Bunty, Fowler, Mac, the rats, they all come along on the ride, but they're just there. The the saving grace is probably Bella Ramsey as Molly. I will say her character feels like the chicken run of old. Her wide-eyed wonder, her desire to see the world, to escape from that chicken farm when she realizes what's going on, the methods that she uses to avoid being brainwashed, and great voice work by Bella Ramsey is like, this is the chicken run I remember. But it's a very small part in an otherwise grand scheme of just, just moot I think it doesn't help that either the voice actors have been replaced or are 23 years older than the last time we saw them. Dandy Newton and Zachary Levi are no Julie Swahala, Swahala, however you pronounce her last name, and Mel Gibson. They seem flat and monotone. And Zachary Levi, I know, can do a good job because she, he voiced Flynn Rider in Tangled. So it's not that he's not a voice actor. They're just, they're not trying to channel the original essence of the ginger and rocky character so you're very aware watching them that they're different voices and in essence are different characters on the other side bunty sounds really old and tired uh and they're basically just doing the same thing they were doing before they're like ah we mustn't panic i'm panicking babs is asking if people are on holidays you know it's either doing the same thing or not bothering to make something new if you're a new voice actor character the one i will give credit to is david bradley who you will know as mr filch or the first doctor from recent stuff um he's the new voice of fowler i believe the old voice of fowler has passed away and he does a bang up job of making the fowler character seem like he was before he matches that tone that uh british general pomposity unfortunately of all the characters he's the one who's left out in the cold the most he's the watch he's the lookout he's left outside the one character that was working for me and he shuts it off screen and you don't see him until the big final point of the rest of the movie i think the thing that hammers it home the most for me about uh the inferiority of this one compared to the original is that sense of threat and tension the original had that this doesn't even though from first glance it looks like the same sort of thing in both movies chickens are being rescued from slaughter but the tone of how they present that and the impact of it varies wildly compared to which movie you're watching the original chicken run has that scene i was mentioning earlier the scene i'm talking about is when uh the chickens have tried to escape multiple times they haven't done it and then the tweedies come in to do some egg counting and they zero in on one particular chicken called edwina slight spoilers for chicken run if you haven't seen it uh, but this is a 23-year-old movie, and hopefully, if anything, it just convinces you that you should check it out. Um, Edwina hasn't been laying eggs. She hasn't laid eggs all week. Whether it's because she can't produce eggs or because Ginger's been forcing her to try to escape the chicken farm all week, hard to say. But on the Tweety farm, if you stop producing eggs, you are no longer of importance to them. So in a very dark, dramatic scene, Mr. Tweety picks up Edwina by the neck, carries her away. Everybody stands around silently. Ginger climbs up on a chicken roof to look away. And you can see through a window the shadow of this chicken being thrown down on a slab 
and then Mrs. Tweedy coming in with a meat cleaver. And you don't see the meat cleaver, but you hear that thud. Edwina has been beheaded. It's upsetting. It's tragic. It hammers home that these chickens, as silly as they've been for the last 20 minutes with these elaborate plans trying to escape the chicken farm, they are on borrowed time. They will die horrible deaths eventually through this simple act. And even to complement it, the next time you see the Tweeties, there's a roast chicken half eaten on the table. Clearly Edwina. That is a powerful scene and it hammers home how this movie is going to balance between silly funny humor and desperate struggle for survival. In Dawn of the Nugget, it's very silly for a majority of it. Every character is a silly buffoon. And then they get to the bit where the... So if, you, if you didn't know that it was a nugget farm, eventually you find out where the so eats a lot representative comes to the factory to see what Mrs. Tweedy and her new husband are proposing to him, which is where I mentioned earlier with the bracelets around the chickens' necks that keeps them docile so they don't know they're going to die so that the nuggets they present are good. In this instance, a chicken is hypnotized, slight spoilers, I guess, but Whatever, I can't really recommend you see it. So if you don't want to know, uh, click away. Uh, this chicken is mesmerized, walked up this silly pink escalator, goes behind a curtain, uh, and then you hear chop, 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 buzz, silly uh, chopping sound effects that you would, and then this bucket of chicken nuggets just magically appears. Clearly that's the chicken that just died. And Mrs. Tweedy's like, I present to you the dawn of the nugget. And they're like, mm, mm, this is a very good nugget. Now, in essence, the exact same thing has happened here that happened in the first movie. A chicken has died, a horrific death, and is now being consumed by the humans. But the gravitas, the despair, the horror of the situation is not at all here in Dawn of the Nugget. It's played for silliness, played for laughs, for slapstick humor. Molly is there she witnesses the thing but she doesn't really she she goes oh my god but it's sort of like oh dear i suppose i'd better get out of here it's nowhere near as impactful as sorrowful as mesmerizing as integral to the plot and it's the, at that moment when that happened and i was like ah okay the movie lost it for me and i think that sums it up for me. It's just inferior to the original. It doesn't feel like it was needed to be made, that it was worth being made. And what we have doesn't contradict the first by any means. It doesn't ruin it. Chicken Run has a glorious ending and no what, nothing that happens in here affects that ending, which is almost as bad though, because the chickens are as good as they were when they first left the last movie. But the fact that it's just sort of there is incredibly disappointing to me. I feel like it could have been so much more, could have been so much better. And instead it's just, it's an okay time. Um, but yeah, I have no desire really to watch it again. And I never will watch it again unless I watch the original. And because it's me, I normally want to watch all of a thing. So if I watch the first movie in a franchise, I end up watching all of it. Just because that's the best way to watch it all. They all complement each other. You can't really watch a sequel in most cases unless you've watched the original. In certain cases. But even then, I wouldn't be like, I have to watch both of them in one day. I could watch The Chicken Run and then go a couple of days and go, all right, I guess I'll watch Dawn and I It's just fine. It's been three days since I saw it. And I kind of have already forgotten most about it. So that's disappointing. It's a four out of 10 for me. Very disappointing. But again, disclaimer, I love the original Chicken Run. I think it's top notch, absolute banger. So I could be unfairly critical. I could be overanalyzing what could just be a good time. I think I've explained my reasons particularly well, but if you disagree with me, by all means, I understand. I could be looking at this in a different light than an objective person would so i guess if you really liked this film let me know in the comments or don't no one really does um or if you agree with me let me know uh as i say though always make up your own mind i never say don't watch a movie i personally didn't enjoy it 
you can't say you didn't enjoy it because I say it was bad. You have to watch it for yourself, I guess. So if you're curious, go check it out. If you're not curious, if you don't give two shits, I don't think your life will be any different if you never watched it. There we are. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, For our last review of the year, next week I'll be reviewing Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, I guess. I'm not that keen on it, but we'll see. Uh, And then we'll cap off this year of our top 10 movies of 2023 before we take a a short New Year break and then we get right back into it with all the content coming for 2024. I'm excited for that. I hope you're excited too, or at the very least, curious. (laughs) Until next week, I love and appreciate you all. Thank you for listening to me for however long. It means a lot. You know this by now. You've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.